Hi, everyone, and welcome to this series of modules on clinical gait analysis. I'm Dr. Ryan Remick, and I'm an assistant professor at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, and I'm also a research scientist at the Kennedy Krieger Institute. In my lab, we focus on understanding how people move and how we can help them to move better. So a lot of the techniques that you'll hear about on these series of modules apply not only to gait analysis, but also to clinical movement analysis in general. Uh, the first talk you'll see here in this first module will be about kinematics, and we'll follow that up with subsequent modules discussing things like kinetics, electromyography, energetics, and overall broad kind of implications of how to perform clinical movement analyses. Before I begin, uh, our lab is part of the Center for Movement Studies here, and we basically all collectively aim to understand how the nervous system controls movement and how we can help people with damage to the nervous system to move better. So we have six investigators here in our faculty group, and all of us focus on different aspects of the rehabilitation process. Uh, we study motor learning. We use non-invasive brain stimulation techniques like transcranial direct current stimulation or transcranial magnetic stimulation. And we also use medical imaging like fMRI to better understand the neural mechanisms that underlie human movement control. If you have any questions uh, throughout the modules or afterward, feel free to contact me. My email address is here below, rme1 at jhmi.edu. As I mentioned, this first module is going to discuss movement kinematics. So how do we study human walking? Well, one, good, one key to any good study or clinical evaluation is good data collection. And I think there are basically four primary components to a comprehensive analysis of human movement. First, which is kinematics. This is gonna be the topic of our conversation today. Kinematics is simply the assessment of motion. So what can we actually see about how the person's moving? Second, our kinetics. These are assessments of the forces that people generate using their muscles to drive movement. Third is electromyography. This is simply the assessment of muscle activity. So electrical recordings taken from skeletal muscles. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about energetics or the assessment of the amount of energy we use to move throughout the world. Throughout these modules, we'll walk through this hypothetical example. As you can see here, the example we'll be working with is, let's say a physical therapist wants to help a stroke patient with hemiparesis to walk better. The therapist has been told by the patient's primary care physician that the patient has a debilitating limp but does not know any further information. So how can we help? The first thing we'll do is we'll study this person's movement, we'll study their kinematics. What we do in our laboratory is we use a three-dimensional motion capture system. So as you can see here, we have relatively large open spaces where we use infrared cameras to track uh, markers on the person's body as they're moving throughout space. So this is similar technology that people often use to make computer, computer digitally animated um, movies or video games. However, here obviously we use it for clinical purposes. There are multiple different types of motion capture systems. One type of motion capture system that we use in our lab is a passive motion capture system. A passive motion capture system uses light emitted from the cameras to bounce off of the participants' um, markers that they're wearing on their body and back to the camera. What this system does is it measures the time it takes for the light to be emitted from the camera and then travel back after it bounces off of those markers that the participant is wearing. There are also systems that are active motion capture systems. We also have one of these in our lab. An active motion capture system doesn't require the reflective markers, but rather light emitting markers. So these are similar to these wired markers that you can see being worn on this black shirt on the top of the screen. What these markers do is they actually send light out to the cameras and they send these uh, lights with a particular signal that's in a prescribed sequence such that the camera knows exactly which uh, marker is tracking which different part of the body. So how do we place the markers? Well, the most important thing that we do is we learn anatomy very well. So we get very familiar with where each marker should be placed on the body. Once we have a good understanding of human anatomy, we identify the question, research question that we're asking. First, which extremities are most important? Obviously, if we're studying walking, we want to make sure that we have very good coverage of the legs. But if you're studying grasping, you might be interested in putting more markers on the fingers or reaching, you might be interested in putting more markers on the arms. The next question is how accurate do you need to be? Oftentimes, this depends on the size of the movements that you're studying. So if you're studying movements that are very large, you might need to be less accurate. You might not have as much of a demand to be very accurate. But if you're studying very fine control, uh, again, finger movements or even slight movements of, uh, of the face, for example, you might need to place more markers uh, on specific areas to ensure higher accuracy. 
In addition to learning anatomy, we also learn to palpate for accurate assessment. We try to put the markers on bony landmarks such that they don't move along with tissues like skin or muscle when the person's moving, but actually track the underlying skeleton. And this allows us to make very precise uh, calculations about how different joints are moving. So for example, if we want to track how the uh, ankle joint is moving over time, we want to calculate the angles that the ankle joint is passing through. We want to make sure that those markers are placed very carefully such that they only move with the bones of the feet and the shank, and they're not actually moving with something like, for example, the calf muscle or some tissue on top of the foot or something like that. We actually want to get very precise uh, markering of that ankle joint center so that we get accurate joint angle calculations. Here are some other cons considerations to keep in mind when performing motion capture studies. First, be sure the marker is placed accurately. Second, place markers directly on the skin as much as possible, as I just mentioned. Third, ensure that your sampling rate is appropriate for the type of data collected. Uh, if you're sampling a relatively um, slow movement or low frequency movement, something like walking, you can use a lower sampling rate, something around 100 hertz. However, if you're doing a very, setting a very ballistic movement, something very fast, like a golf swing or um, a jump, you might need to collect at higher frequencies up to even 1,000 hertz. It's also important to collect static reference data so that you can ensure that your markers are placed appropriately and that you also have some um, initial reference for how the, the body or the markers are fixed to the body before you begin to study how the body's moving. And then we often also use simultaneous digital video. And again, this allows us to understand, well, one, it allows us to see where the markers are placed, and it can also help us to understand if the marker had fallen off or moved throughout a trial. So how do we quantify human kinematics? First, we understand our anatomical, ref, uh, anatomical planes. And so here on the left, you see the transverse plane. In the middle, you see the frontal plane. And on the right, you see the sagittal plane. So these are all different planes of movement where we can study different important features of walking. Uh, most of the walking parameters that we are primarily interested in occur in the sagittal plane, but there are times when we also study features of these other planes of movement. Here's some brief examples of, of different movements that occur in the transverse frontal and sagittal planes. Uh, you'll also notice that many of these examples are movements that we commonly do uh, throughout the day, and so therefore it's very important to understand uh, what different types of movements occur in which plane and how these might be um, appropriate or relevant for your patients that you're seeing in the clinic. So to conclude today, uh, kinematics, we're trying to go from motion to data. So if we go back to that example we talked about uh, uh, regarding the stroke patient who has a limp, we want to be able to quantify that limp in some way. So if I play a quick video here, you can see this is motion capture collected from a patient. The blue leg or the left leg here is their leg that's been affected by the stroke. And you can tell that they're walking asymmetrically or they show a little bit of a limp, but we don't really know much more than that. Once we use the outputs from our motion capture system, we can see several important things about this patient's walking pattern. For example, on their left leg, they show much smaller range of motion at the ankle and they generate significantly less push off with that ankle uh, in terms of the uh, joint angles that it passes through. That's up here on the right. In the middle on the right, you can also see that they walk with much less knee flexion in that impaired leg or that blue leg than they do in their unimpaired leg. And then finally in the hip, you see some, some abnormal hip kinematics here as well, where you can see the red leg or the, the right leg begins to move into extension much later in the gait cycle than the impaired leg. So this is an example of how we would use this three-dimensional motion capture data to assess a stroke patient's gait.